Welcome back, everybody. This is another episode of the Exodus Project. I'm your host, Steve Eisenhower, and today I am back with Paul versus Moses, um, part two. Like I said, we we delved into part one last time. This is going to be a multifaceted series on all of the problems of Paul versus Moses, and trust me, there are many. And what's funny is this time we are actually going to hone in on the same passage as last time, which just goes to show that not only not only the topic of last last episode, but this one, this whole book's a mess. Um, we have two major discrepancies in just one citation. But before I get started, hit that subscribe button, turn on the notifications, everyone, give me a big thumbs up, and please, please, please check that description. We got Learn Hebrew in One Hour with Rabbi Federo. We have a question sheet if you have questions, and many resources you may need, including my new book, um, the Christian Coloring Book. Physical copy linked in the description, and shoot me an email if you would like the free ebook. So... Let's get right to it. Paul versus Moses. So where were the jar of manna and Aaron's rod located inside the tabernacle? Very, very important question. Let's see what the book of Hebrews has to say. Okay, so the Pauline school. Hebrews 9, 3 and 4. Same passage as last time. Behind the second curtain, which is the Holy of Holies, was a second section called the Most Holy Place, having the golden altar of incense, we talked about that last time, and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which, now this is what you need to be mindful of, okay, this is what we're covering this time, is in which, meaning that inside the Ark, it's saying these things existed, okay, was a golden urn holding the manna, and Aaron's staff that budded, okay, and the tablets of the covenant. So what this is saying is that according to the author of Hebrews, whether it be Paul or another individual of Pauline influence, keep that in mind, the authorship is disputed, but fundamentalist Christianity does believe that Paul authored Hebrews, the golden urn of manna and Aaron's budded staff were put into the Ark of the Covenant itself, put into the Ark, right? That's important. That's what Hebrews is saying, is that the budded staff and the golden urn of manna were put into the Ark of the Covenant. Is this what the Torah states? Let's see. So the Torah and Moses. Exodus 16.32 and Moses said, this is what the Lord commands. Fill an omer. That's a measurement, you know, for a... Not something we really need to get into, but, for example, between Pesach and Shavuos, there is a counting of the omer, which has to do with grain. We don't need to get into that, just side note. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread with which I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you from the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron... Take a pot, okay? The word here in Hebrew is tzinsenet. Okay, right here. This is the word. And it actually means an earthen vessel. So that's just a side note. Hebrew says that it's a golden urn. Well, when you actually translate the Hebrew, it means an earthen vessel. Okay? And put an omer full of manna in it and lay it before, lay it up before, and here's the Hebrew word, Laponai the Hashem, to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before, that's the same word in Hebrew, the testimony to be kept. Okay? So before, keep that in mind and keep that Hebrew word in mind. And we are going to actually delve into what exactly that word means. In most cases, before would never mean inside of. Okay? Unless you're saying that it's in front of the tablets in the ark. But 
that's that's not the case here. And as I said, we're going to see an exact definition of what that word in Laponi means. <clears throat> so here, this is just in case you don't believe me. This is a di- I, I screenshotted this. This is directly from Hebrew Translate. Okay, it means in front of. You see this? This is the exact same word. Right? Lamad pe nun yud. Laponai. Exact same thing. And it means in front of. So what is what is the Torah actually saying? That the earthen vessel of manna was put in front of the Ark of the Testimony, not inside of it. Okay? So once again, if you can't even get these basics right, why should I trust anything else you have to say? You know, that's going to be a, a very, a very umbrella, t- uh, umbrella-like idea as this series progresses, is if you can't even get the basic things which are verifiable. You can go back to the Torah and check these things if you're going to write these things in a book. So if you can't even get that right, why should I trust the hidden secret teachings, right? In front of, it's right there in front of you. Okay, so let's continue on. Number 17, 21. And Moses spoke to the people of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece. Just some context, TLDR. This is right after the Korach rebellion. Okay. From each prince one, according to their father's houses, 12 rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before. Same exact word, people. Same exact word. All of the rods laid up the rods in front of Hashem in the tent of testimony. And it came to pass that on the day, on the next day, Moses went into the tent of testimony, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi had budded, and brought forth buds and bloom blossoms and yielded almonds. And Moses brought out all of the rods from before the Lord, same word, from in front of Hashem, to all the people of Israel, and they looked. And took every man his rod. And the Lord said to Moses, and Hashem said to Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again, right? This means put it in the same place that you did before. Bring Aaron's rod again in front of the testimony. Same Hebrew word. Laponai. Same word. Right? To be kept for a sign against the rebels, that there may be an ending of their murmurings against me, that they die not. Super clear. I mean, I I don't think it gets much more clear than this. Clearly, they're not inside the ark, but rather they're sitting in front of it, right? We demonstrated that even through a basic Hebrew translation, this Hebrew word, lapani, means in front. Uh, The Ten Commandments, you'll have no no gods before me, alpani, right? Same exact thing. Moving forward. 1 Kings 8 and 9. A little bit of context before we get into this. This is the dedication of the first temple, Solomon's temple. Um, So we're going to see what actually was inside of the ark when the temple was dedicated. Okay? 1 Kings 8 verse 9. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone, which Moses put there at Horev, when, the, when Hashem made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. So, when the first temple is erected, the ark is brought back by David a few years prior. When the temple is dedicated and the ark is inside the Holy of Holies, there is nothing except the two tablets, a.k.a. the Ten Commandment tablets, inside of the ark. Second Chronicles 5.10 there was nothing in the ark save except the two tablets which Moses put in at Horeb. When the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel, when they came from Egypt. But you might say, Steve, you know, maybe they were taken out by someone when the ark was taken before David retrieved it. Well, I'm already 10 steps ahead of you, and my next slides are going to show that that's not possibly the case. Okay, so let's continue on. 1 Samuel 4.10 And the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and they fled every man to his tent. There was a very great slaughter. 
for there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. And the ark of God was captured. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were killed. Okay, so we see that the, the Philistines, they take the ark, they destroy the tabernacle at Shiloh. Jeremiah 7.12, talking about the same thing. But now go to my place, which was in Shiloh. That's where the tabernacle was. Where I set my name at first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people. Okay, see what I did to it. Okay, and now because you have done all these deeds, says Hashem, and though I spoke to you from early in the morning, but you did not listen, and I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, will I do to this house, speaking of the first temple, which is called by my name, and in which you trust, and to the place which I gave you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh, showing that the tabernacle at Shiloh was in fact destroyed. Okay, because the temple was destroyed. And there's a likening here, okay? So when the ark was taken, we see that the, temp the tabernacle, the mishkan, the tent of meeting, was destroyed. And Jeremiah is simply just reinforcing that point when he's talking about the looming destruction of the first temple. Okay? Psalm 78, 59. When God heard this, he was angry and greatly loathed Israel, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh the tent where he made his dwelling among men, and he delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. You could understand that the carrying off of the ark. But if there's only the tablets inside the ark, right? This is what I need to... This now is what I really need to hammer home before we go into this next citation. What's very important here is if the jar of, ma the jar of manna and the budded staff were laid in front of the ark, right? Because this is this is important. If the budded staff was a sign that people aren't that the Levites shouldn't rebel, right? Because Korach, Korach was a Levite, and he said, "Hey, why should only Aaron get the opportunity to be a priest? We're all Levites, right?" So the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting would be taken down and put up depending on where the Israelites were. Okay, the traveling in the wilderness. So if you have, and when you assemble it, you start from the Holy of Holies and work your way out. So those things would be a reminder to the Levites as they're dealing with setting up the Mishkan that, hey, you know, the, the house of Aaron, that's where the priests come from. Okay, that's, that's the sign, right? If it were the temple, and only one person is actually going to be ever going into this room, it's a permanent structure, you're not setting it up and taking it down, what type of sign would that serve? Okay, and that's that's kind of the point here that I wanted to get across before I move on, is the Mishkan, it moved with the people, therefore it was taken down and set up. And as the Levites would be setting it up, that budded rod in front of the Ark, the Aron, would serve as that reminder of Korok's rebellion and maintain the house of Aaron is in fact our priesthood and we shouldn't rebel. Okay, that's that's the point I wanted to get across there. But when it's destroyed, okay, when it's destroyed, if you're carrying off the ark, you're not going to worry about the things that are outside of it, right? You're going to destroy those things. So it's pretty clear that those things would be destroyed. We saw in the previous citations that only inside the ark was the tablets. The other things weren't returned to the temple to be set up. So it's pretty clear when the Mishkan was destroyed, those were destroyed with it. Okay? 1 Samuel 5.1 And the Philistines captured the ark of God and brought it from Aben Hazer to Ashdod. When the Philistines captured the ark of God, they brought it to the house of Dagon. And set it by Dagon. Okay? Set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen upon his face to the earth before, in front of, the ark of Hashem. And they took Dagon and set him in place again. And when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen upon his face before the ark of Hashem. It's that same exact word, in front of. So unless Dagon is swan diving into the ark, I don't think that word means inside of the ark. 
but rather it means that he's falling, the statue of Dagon is falling prostrate before the Ark of Hashem, the Ark of the Covenant. And the head of Dagon in both palms of his hands laid severed on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Pretty clear that in the presence of the Ark of Hashem, where the, where the um, Shekhinah would, would, would dwell, right? No idol, no idol could stand above that. And Hashem causes said idol to fall and be evidently not higher than the Ark of Hashem. But not only that lesson, what's important is it's that same word, Laponai, in front of the Ark. Not inside of it, right? 2 Samuel 6.6 6. And when they came to Nachon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the Ark of God. Everyone knows this story, right? And took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God struck him there for his error, and there he died by the Ark of God. Same word. Okay? Okay. Now, if the Philistines carried the Ark off, we understand that the Ark had, had poles that went through the golden rings so you could carry it without actually touching it. So if the Philistines carried it and those items were inside prior to David retrieving it, right? Because we see at the dedication of the temple that those items, the, the budded staff and the jar of manna are not inside the Ark. Okay, so if we understand that it's carried off, but when it's returned, only the tablets are inside. That would mean that a Philistine would have needed to open it up and take those things out. Right? That's simple logic. But if even an Israelite, because this context, this is on the return trip. David and his cohorts defeated the Philistines and they're, they're taking it back. Right? They're bringing it back to Jerusalem. The ox shakes. And they feel that the ark is going to fall off the wagon. So this man puts out his hand to stop it from falling and it kills him. If someone who is trying to be reverent to the ark is killed, imagine what someone who destroyed the tabernacle and carried the ark back in front of an idol would be treated if they tried to open it and take out these things that are inside of it. I don't think that would work too well. We have the exact same story in 1 Chronicles 13.9. And when they came to the threshing floor of Kidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he struck him, because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died, same word, before Lapunai, God, Hashem. So, I don't think in any context that could mean he died inside God. It could only mean in front of, before, right? If... In any case, we are always before God, in front of God. He's everywhere, right? So that um, I think that pretty much settles it as to whether or not this thing was inside the ark. Uh, we have multiple citations, and we also have multiple reasons to believe that these things were never put inside because in the Torah it says you're going to put them in front, um, the Mishkan's destroyed, the Philistines carry the Ark off, people who are reverent to the Ark die from simply just touching it, trying to keep it from touching the ground, fall off the cart, they put out their hand to stop it, and even that is payable on death. So how much more the enemies of God who set it in front of an idol, whose idol falls in front of the Ark, it says, that exact same Hebrew word, um, I would think if they tried to desecrate it, open it up, take things out of it, they equally would die. Um, so when we see that only the tablets are inside of it when Solomon dedicates the temple, we can understand that only the tablets were inside of it regardless, or even in the time of the Mishkan. Okay? So, it is again clear that the Pauline author of Hebrews was not familiar with the Torah. And he was not familiar with the events recounted in the prophets or the writings. Once again, making evident the biblical illiteracy and lack of care given when this divinely inspired book was written.
Okay? I'm going to harp on this point continually throughout this series. If you cannot get the basics right, like I said, something that is verifiable. I just went through and verified what the Torah says next to what Hebrews says. Right? If God's writing the book, do you think he would get it wrong? I would hope not. Okay? So, if you can't get those basics right, why should I trust your esoteric, secret, hidden teachings that, in the words of Tertullian, I have to trust your veracity for? Right? A uh, recent video I did, Tertullian speaks about if Paul was a true apostle, and he gives criteria saying that, you know, we only have your teachings and have to trust you on your word and the truthfulness of Paul. So if he can't even get these things right, we must reject everything else that gets said. You know, because once again, for the third time, these things are verifiable. You can go back into the Torah, you can go back into the writings, you can go back into the prophets, and you can check all the things that I just put up here. It's clear they didn't do that. Right? And if he's not willing to do that, if he's not willing to at least check his work, that shows us a couple things. It shows us the audience was more than likely illiterate to such things. And it also shows that they are either careless or illiterate to such things. So to say that the Pauline school, if Paul wrote this, if Paul wrote this, okay, two scenarios. If Paul wrote this, and he was a student of Rabban Gamliel, the giant of his generation. Um, he wasn't too great of a student then and must have been getting F's on all his tests because he didn't even know basic knowledge that I, as a non-Jew who grew up a Christian, was able to tease out. Further, if it's written by a student of Paul, who was a student of Gamliel, and he learned these things, then he wasn't passing the knowledge on too well. Right? So it just goes to show that the Pauline way of thinking was not the Pharisaic way of thinking. It's not, it's not birthed from Torah Judaism. If that was, if, if his studentship of Gamliel was true, he was not doing a good job, or he was not passing, was not passing the information along properly. So how can we trust him on the esoteric things when the basics are incorrect? Okay? And that's, going to be over and over. Every video in this series is going to harp on that point that it cannot be trusted, must be rightly rejected, and I think it's pretty striking, I think it's a very important point that in the same two verses of the same chapter of the same book, we've teased out two major discrepancies that have each yielded 15 to 25 minute videos. Right? So... Keep that in mind, everyone. I hope that helps. I hope that enlightens on some things. That there are things that most people would just read over and never pay mind to. But when, we, when we're meticulous, right? This is about the details. Did God author this book? This is pretty clearly not authored by God, right? So can we trust the person who wrote it? Well, if they can't even get these things right, then we shouldn't trust them on anything else. And as we get deeper into this, we're going to see that not only are the meticulous, I guess you could say mundane, I don't want to really use that word, but the mundane details, if those are wrong, why should we trust the deep theological ones? Because they're more than likely going to be equally as wrong and even more impactful on what we believe and how we approach re religiosity. So, yeah, like I said, I hope this helps. Um, I hope this, hope this was enlightening and I hope it helps show that, you know, the Pauline school and the Pauline train of thought, it just, it's, it's incorrect and, um, they're not paying attention to detail, clearly not the word of God and disagrees with Moses, which we, no one would disagree that Moses, Moses has an exclusive prophecy of being awake and hearing all his prophecies in an awakened state, not in a dreamlike state like other prophets. Um, Moses is the greatest prophet of all time. And if you're in disagreement with him, you're a false prophet. I'm, I'm sorry, to, uh, sorry to break it to you, but Paul, if anything, was 
a heretic, a false prophet, and you know he's he's the reason we have the the Christianity we have today. So, yeah. Until next time, everybody. I'm Steve Eisenhower. This was the Exodus Project. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm Yisrael Chai. See you next time, everyone.